Welcome back to another edition of the SHEP Alumni Insight Series. I'm here this afternoon with James Dick, who is a fellow Washington and Lee graduate and SHEP alum. And again, I'm Danielle Brydon Quat, SHEP's Alumni Engagement Specialist. So with that, I will start by asking you, James, what drew you to the Shepherd program at Washington and Lee? Well, it's kind of embarrassing to say, but I, I've become comfortable with how shallow I was when I was 18, and it was just part of my evolution. I thought, this seems unique. I don't know that any other place that I know has knows anything about poverty, and I was a, a, I'd already decided in high school I was going to just study economics and classics, and so it's very type A. I thought, yeah, we'll do a minor too. So that's how I that's how I chose it because it was different. Okay, fair enough, and it was. Um, and of course, we know that a lot of SHEP participants also do an internship. So I'm curious to know why you decided to spend one of the summers of your undergraduate years doing an internship and how you ended up in Arkansas. Well, I think the, uh, the answer to that, the second part of the question, I think anyone who knows Dr. Beckley will giggle. I ended up in Arkansas because Dr. Beckley knew that's where I was meant to be. And uh, he, he told me probably from the time I was a freshman, you know, James, Arkan, I can't do a very good Harlan impression voice. James, this is, we really need to get you there. And I don't think I probably understood why for a couple of years afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess to answer your first question, I, I've always loved volunteer work and I love giving back. Um, I was a part of the Bonner Leader Program. And so I thought that doing a shepherd internship would just be a really exciting way to get volunteer hours. Um, I was all about trying new and exciting things. And I thought the Mississippi Delta, Dr. Beckley says it was a good place, sign me up. Um, and not to get too deep, but I, I would say that, that that experience was a landmark turning point for me. Um, it, was, it was just so different. Um, I'm from a middle-class community in Northern New York State, you know, um, I just was not, I remember calling home and saying, you know, mom, the black people live on one side of what used to be the railroad tracks. The white people live on the other side. They go to different churches. They go to different schools. It's surreal. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Um, I even think Kiana, who had been there a couple of years before me, she was seen raw sewage there, which I did not see, but it was, it was just a different, it was a different world. And on top of that, I was in a very small house with five girls. I was the only male intern there that summer. And um, I slept on an air mattress in the air conditioned back porch. And I, I'm not a runner, but I went on runs as often as I could because there was just so much estrogen. And I was like, a bull in the china shop like I, I said the wrong thing and did the wrong thing frequently in retrospect i legitimately did say and do the wrong thing um but it was that summer made me realize because i was very academically focused in my first two years at wnl and that summer made me realize that there is a whole heck of a lot more to life than what your gpa is and what organizations you're in and i think um, that experience made me much as a person, much more relationally focused and much less focused on, you know, the resume type details of life. And um, it was a, it was a wonderful experience. And I think that 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 Harlan picked correctly for me. Um, but it was uh, yeah, it was it was it was an unbelievable time. Well, it sounds like you learned a lot. And I was going to ask you yeah. about your biggest takeaway, but you listed quite a few. So we won't go into that um, unless there's anything you feel like really I stood will, out. You know, before we started recording, you told me about how um, it's no longer studying so much poverty, but also encouraging, encouraging human flourishing. And mm -hmm. uh, I was one reason I'm so glad to hear that is one of the very dumb things I said, one of the many dumb things I said when I was in an internship was at a small group at someone at, a, at one of the other interns workplaces, a small community center. And I'd never been there before, even though she worked there every day. And towards the end of our time there, we all got to go. And it was kind of neat to see where Megan had been working. And towards the end, we got to meet some of the other interns who were working at this organization who were all from the area. 
and they said, hey, you know, we were all sitting around in a circle later. What do you, what do you guys think? And I said something that I thought was very kind to the effect of it really is wonderful that, you know, you've grown up in this tiny place and you're staying here to invest in the community. And of course, as you might imagine, I probably said it in an even less nice way than that. And one of the other interns said, do you know what you said? Do you know how that played with them? Said, no, no, I have no idea. I'm 20 years old and very self-focused. Why don't you tell me? And she's like, you just sound so patronizing that you're like, you're this great person who's coming in here and their community is like, who the heck would want to live here is, is the way you came across. And, uh, you know, remembering, I've always remembered that. And, you know, one of my main takeaways is that you might look and you might see poverty, bad, poverty, bad, but that's very, that's very short-sighted. That's not the way people look at their own lives and their own communities. They see the strengths and, and we should see the strengths too, instead of just focusing on why something is bad. Um, and I think that that is a, that's a, that it's a paradigm shift, but it's something that's important and it affects how we talk about poverty. And so, you know, I think it's so important to talk more about human capability, more about the resources that can be developed more and that are already in the community rather than, well, you lack this and you lack that. Cause it mm -hmm. just, it puts people on the defensive and it, it really in many ways creates a reality that doesn't need to be there. Right, that false baseline of like compared to what, right? Like a deficit mm -hmm. based on whose definition. So yes, you and I are in agreement. I think the shift towards human flourishing and capabilities, the resource mindset, strength based, it's Very all. Exciting. I'm on board with it for sure. So I'm curious, since you graduated, what you've been up to? Well, I um I couldn't quite find a job that I thought really fit me after graduation, and so my brother and I. Uh, each took a gap year. He's four years younger than I am. So he took a year off before college. I took a year off before working and we backpacked through Central and South America. Um, so we did a lot of touristy things, but we also worked with a number of different nonprofits um, through different churches that we attended, um, you know, helped build some relief houses, um, helped do some painting, um, visited. I, I was able to do um, I had a, a Johnson Opportunity Grant to work for a small microfinance organization in Peru before my senior year. So we got to visit that. Um, so it's just a really interesting experience. Um, just a great time with my brother. Um, we traveled to save money. We traveled by tour bus, which is kind of the easy way to get around to South America, especially. And we realized that we spent 328 hours on a bus in four months. It's a lot of bus rides, including one 48 hour bus to get us from Buenos Aires back to Peru. So it was quite an exciting experience. Um, but when I got back, I started working for um, a company owned by a family friend, an ins uh, a retail insurance agency. It was a financial service. I had no idea. I didn't know anything about insurance. Um, but what was really interesting was that Mr. Merriam, the owner, worked with a lot of homeless shelters around the country. And um, I had been interested in homelessness. I did um, in the, I think in the fall of my freshman year, I did an urban plunge with a couple other um, mm. shep shepherd students. And that was really interesting being homeless on the street in DC for 48 hours. Um, it is very uncomfortable to sleep on a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. It's one of the, one of the things I discovered. Um, but, um, and so our, I've been working for, the, in, in the retail insurance space ever since, um, you know, being a commercial insurance broker is a lot like being an attorney. You have a specialization typically. And, you know, there's some people obviously who do like home insurance and auto insurance, but, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of folks will have like, they'll do a lot of construction. They'll do a lot of real estate. They'll do marine insurance because everything needs insurance. Um, anyone's building could burn down. Anyone's car could get in an accident. Anyone could have a cyber attack and need to yeah. come up with money for a ransomware. Um, so all of these, you know, every industry has insurance. 
Um, so it's been really interesting to be a part of our practice where, you know, while we do other things, we work with a lot of faith-based homeless shelters or rescue missions all around the country. Um, and it's really, it's really interesting to realize that the, the process, like as an outsider, I thought, oh, you know, I mean, what do you do? You just cook food, you provide a place to stay, like, is there more to it? And, you know, now that I've become much more of a, 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 a consultant for them, I realize, you know, it is a prof helping the homeless and the disadvantaged is as much a profession as being an accountant or, or anything else. Because, you know, as we start to learn in, in the shepherd, poverty is complicated. It's not just mm -hmm. one reason why people become poor or even one reason why we become, why someone becomes homeless. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially if you don't have on the ground experience to meet people who are homeless. Um, and I actually lived on campus at, a, at the local city mission for five years. Um, they had a transitional housing program at the time I moved in, I had a roommate who had struggled with homelessness. And so when he eventually moved out, but I stayed and I, I volunteered and, you know, as anyone knows who works closely and forms relationships with people who are in a different socio and economic demographic, they're very similar to we are. I mean, they're, they're people who, you know, laugh and they, they cry and they like to eat and they want to have friends and, you know, just, so working at the desk at the homeless shelter was just such a big takeaway. Like there was really not a huge difference between us. Um, yeah, any of us so, is, you know, a few paychecks away from that, unfortunately, depending on the family and other resources we have access to. It's a lot closer than a lot of us would like to admit. Yeah, yeah. There's there's that aspect to it, absolutely, where we sort of realize our own sort of financial frailty and how fortunate right. we are. But then the flip side of just how human someone who's Absolutely. homeless or what we would consider poor is, like they're very much our neighbor. Um, and that's something even in our industry, if you will, you know, a lot of folks have said, let's step away from calling them homeless because since mm -hmm. when does your home define you as your person? Yeah. I mean, yes, you know, we want people to be housed who need housing, but it's not something that defines you or should define you as a person. Um, Certainly. So it's, I love working in that space. There's always, because most, most organizations that serve the homeless, they aren't just trying to provide three hots and a cot. Um, they're really, they want to help people change their lives. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have, you know, nine month, 18 month programs to try to help someone build a work ethic and build back their credit and maybe get their GED. And it's, it's not a one size fits all. So the organizations are always trying to think of new things that they can do. Um, I hosted a webinar a little earlier today where one of our clients out in California was talking about, um, you know, a new housing project they brought online, but also how they're starting to roast coffee because mm. they think they can sell coffee to their donors. And the experience of roasting coffee is a good experience for folks who are trying to build job skills. Mm -hmm. So there's just, there's a lot of creativity in the industry. And of course, there aren't so many insurance, there aren't so many homeless shelters out there where insurance companies say, oh, we totally understand. We understand a life transformation ministry or organization, we get it. And so my job is very much to be sort of this middleman that says, you know, you see that they have a sawmill, but let me assure you, it's not as crazy as you think. Mm -hmm. Like they have a policy and procedure. They're being methodical about who uses this and who's tra who trains it. You know, a lot of insurance and risk management is really being logical and methodical about doing things safely and correctly, um, which is not always as easy as it sounds because it requires you doing it all the time right and you know it's and a lot of the little people things. in place to manage it that is mm -hmm. super cool what mm -hmm. you were saying about being kind of an intermediary and like so, you speak insurance yeah. so I, I, but I think you that's also... probably a long enough answer to your question no that's terrific i mean i love that idea of like speaking insurance and speaking services for people who are without a home 
and trying to navigate like, okay, these are the services that are needed. This is the kind of risk management that's needed. Like, let's figure it out. Let's get a policy. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of just leaving people kind of in the dark and, and underinsured, for example, and then, you know, in the event of a crisis, really having a problem on their hands, when really all they're trying to do is good work, right? Like, that's what they set out to do um, when they founded their organization. So that is fantastic. Um, I do have a question about like how your Shepherd internship and your experience within the Shepherd program influences the work you do and sort of how the work you do you think reflects some of the lessons you may have learned. Yeah, I mean, I think I credit the Shepherd program with just helping me take a closer look at why poverty even exists. Um, mm -hmm. I, re I still remember taking the 101 course and realizing, wait, most poverty in the U.S. isn't isn't urban; it's rural. How how is that possible? And I, I I think that was one of many things that I realized. Wow, this isn't exactly the way that I think it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that that I sort of take that approach to now a lot of things in life. Is you know I'll be I'll read something or I'll be told something you know either by someone through work, either an insurance company who's saying, well, you can't do this, or someone at a homeless shelter who's saying, well, we want to do this. And we try to be creative about how we think about it and, you know, un understand what exactly is going on, because it's too easy to sort of hear something and jump to a conclusion, like, I have a sawmill, or, you know, we have people who used to be drug addicts driving vehicles and or we have we're hiring someone who's a registered sex offender and you can jump to a conclusion but if you dig into the details a lot of times you realize it's not as unusual as you think it, it is yep right and people need grace you know in society we need to extend grace as a way to to function and flourish right if we don't then we exclude these whole groups of people on the basis of one fact or one past experience I love that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really powerful, the work that you're doing. And I'm glad that there are people out there like you who have the information they need to show up with creative solutions to really important societal problems and challenges. So thank you for sharing mm -hmm. a bit of your professional experiences. Uh, you know, of course, there may be Shep interns out there who are thinking about career in, careers in insurance or they never considered it, but after hearing what you said, they may reach out. So thank you for being sort of an ambassador for your field, if you will. And I have one final Absolutely. question, which is um, now that you're a parent, I'm wondering if your thoughts about poverty or human flourishing have changed and how. Did we get a little disconnected there? Are you pausing to think? Yes, I, it, it was, but you, you'd sort of given me a preview of this question, which I'm thankful for. Otherwise, I don't know that I would have had a good answer. Um, I think I will, again, just display my incredible naivete as a younger person. And um, I think when I was younger, I would think, how are people who are poor have so many kids? I don't get it. Like, don't they realize how much they cost and it's inconvenient and you're maybe you're not married or you're in a tough situation. Why, why, why? I just don't understand. And I think having, um, which I apologize how insensitive I used to be. It's just, it's, there was just so many areas like that. Um, but I think what I realize is there's so much joy that comes from having um, a, like a child in your life, like just their curiosity and their energy. It, it's really, it sort of like transforms your living space. And so now I almost think of it as, well, I could understand why someone who has some tough things going on in their life would be excited to have a kid because it's a really special part of life. And yeah, you know, I think as a, a typical white middle class type A person, I think, well, I got to save for this and I got to buy this and I got to go to this kind of school. And, you know, to a certain extent, you know, those things are important, but um, just being there and um, enjoying a child is a really special experience. And it really, it's, 
You don't, almost don't need anything other than your imagination to do it. Um, so for whatever that's worth, that's, I think, one of my takeaways on human flourishing and now that I've become a parent. One thing I heard throughout your remarks was the idea of sort of suspending judgment and in our initial impressions of things. And it is very easy to go out into the world and see things and hear things and think like, well, this is how I think about it, right? And, mm -hmm. and that wisdom that comes with age a little bit of just interacting with people who do think differently and then having the opportunity to reflect and say, well, I used to think about it like that. And now I've heard all these other people's perspectives and I think about it like this. And mm -hmm. that's a gift even to be able yeah. to live long enough to kind of reformulate the way we think about the world. And I hope that in some small way, the Shepherd program can help activate some of those neurons that are inclined to question and to reconsider mm -hmm. and to dialogue about things that otherwise, you know, become default based on our upbringing and the people we're mm -hmm. around who can be really mm -hmm. similar to us in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I, I think certainly, unfortunately, political discourse has sort of degenerated a lot where everyone wants to express a, not only a problem, but a solution in 168 characters, which is ludicrous. <laughs> right. um, and uh, I was, I was an economics major. And, you know, one thing I, I took away from my econometrics classes was that when you're running a regression and you're thinking, well, what are the variables for GDP growth? It's never one thing. It's just never one thing. It's always a little bit of all these things. And I think we need to be able to be comfortable with that sort of ambiguity when we're trying mm -hmm. to figure out both you know, problems that affect us and societal problems as well. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of different factors and to try to distill it into a tweet is, or, or a solution into a tweet. It's is just not going to happen. You just can't do it. You have to yeah. have that dialogue. That's right. Well, there you have it, folks. Kudos to a liberal arts education that allows people to study economics and the classics and poverty yes. all in a four year period. Thank you, James, for your time today. And all of you viewers out there, thank you for your time. As always, we're available on our website and social media. Looking forward to connecting with you soon. Thank you.